elongated skulls, along with their origins, are undoubtedly one of the most heavily debated areas within modern archaeology. Many independently funded researchers who have explored and subsequently exposed vast arrays of unusual and as yet inexplicable features surrounding a particularly few examples of these intriguing and incredibly puzzling artifacts. For regardless of known head-binding practices, a well-studied and historically an extremely common practice, thus one which modern science has an extensive understanding of, including the effect this had on the shape of the skull, makes any skull which endured these traditions are easily to identify post-mortem. The most commonly found incorporated wooden boards pressed upon the head, creating large, flat areas along the frontal lobes. Pressing the brow area of the skull upward, this malformation creates a crease or bulge near the normal napping areas of the skull, as seen in these photos of remains currently claimed as a suspected alien found in Croatia. Yet due to this knowledge of malformation, we can easily identify that it is indeed of a homo sapien. This so-called crease is easily identifiable upon bone structure. However, as previously mentioned, there exists a particular few whose remains not only have an elongated cranium, but the individuals in which they belong not only possess said craniums undeniably formed via natural processes but are identical in appearance to millions of witness testimonies describing what we all now know as the greys. With huge eyes, long wide craniums, frames of a tiny stature and micro-thin pelvis, remains of tiny humanoids, possibly visitors to our planet, who may have crashed here, subsequently marooned upon our planet, is an account which has been told before. We have in the past explored the compelling story surrounding the Dropa discs, an ancient upar that, according to a number of individuals who have examined and tested them, tell this exact tale. Long barrows, granges, earthworks, and henges found across the United Kingdom all have rumors surrounding long-headed skulls being covered up after having been found at the sites. Passionately protected from trespassers, a vast number of the largest barrows have never been opened. 12-ton stones blocking the entrances, clearly suggesting they are buildings of tremendous importance, but without enormous multi-million pound machinery, permits, and most importantly, permission from the landowners, conveniently, all these incredible undug sites are set on private lands. We will probably never find what's inside, but many rumors abound like those which circle Bella's nap, tales which tell of more elongated skulls exhumed from the surrounding Earth during a normal archaeological exploration. Yet regardless of this seemingly meticulous suppression in the UK, an incredible find has nonetheless been unearthed in Crimea. Many of the intriguing features of the remains are the same characteristics which gave rise to the elongated skulls of Peru's popularity. Yet this skull still possesses its tiny, complete skeleton. The eye sockets, which once housed the creature's eyes, were enormous, and although the entire frame of the creature is of a small size, the lack of a pronounced pelvis would have made them very slender and would have emphasized the size of the cranium. It is a strong candidate for the only complete elongated skull remains in existence. We find the elongated skull Highly compelling. The ancient ruins of Giza, perhaps the most incredible of them all, and possibly the clearest displays of academic conspiracy, with much of the most puzzling of areas all but closed off, away from public view. An attempt to stifle controversial questions, which inevitably arise from such baffling ancient wonders. However, this attempt to obscure the greatest aspects of ancient Giza just fans the flames of curiosity. For when one realizes that much of ancient Egypt is being actively covered up, so-called officials avoid any obligation to explain the methodology. Behind many constructions found on the plateau, structures and relics, which to this day, escape any logical explanation. Once one accepts this reality, 
one begins to wonder what unspoken motivation there could be to ardently hide these sites' true characteristics. We have in the past covered many areas of ancient Giza, which cannot be explained. Many people are aware of the issues surrounding the construction of the pyramids, and the largely exposed void in modern understandings. However, this conundrum is but one among a smorgasbord of highly intriguing yet no less mystifying features hidden in plain sight all over the plateau. The basalt floor, which still contains volumes of tool marks, evident of high-precision, high-rotation ancient power tools. The gigantic megalithic blocks, each sunk flat, level with the base of the pyramids, which, although walked over by millions, have been largely overlooked by all. Some of these blocks, forming the immediate foundations of the pyramids, are similar in size to the pregnant woman of Baalbek, which is estimated to weigh some 1,000 tons. Additionally, all of these features, according to mainstream teachings, were created by the ancient Egyptians, a civilization we claim merely re-inhabited the site, like many others around the world. It is a fitting hypothesis, which if indeed the case, then all said tasks were undertaken and masterfully accomplished with nothing more than a set of soft copper tools. A clearly illogical hypothesis, disproven in many ways, one of which is by the main pink Aswan granite relics still in existence all over Egypt, which were all simply impossible to have created with just copper chisels, and our next artifact of interest is of no exception. This imposing altar was found at the west end of a passage, just outside the northern wall of the temple of King Amenemhat I. Originally, it is presumed that the altar once stood in the open court of the temple, with its roughly shaped lower part suggesting that it was sunk into the ground. A rectangular libation basin is carved into the top of the altar, as well as representations in flat relief of an offering mat containing two libation basins and three loaves of bread, the middle one incised with the king's throne, with the name Horus added, with the phrase, May he be given life forever, uncannily similar to long live the king, but I digress. At the center of the altar's front side, the incised birth name of the king Amenemhat, with rows of approaching fertility figures who are designated by inscriptions as personifications of gnomes, regional governorates of northern and southern Egypt. It is undoubtedly an incredible ancient artifact, one carved with such precision and artistic accuracy, and upon some of the hardest stone on earth, to suggest this was achieved with soft chisels is to us absurd. Who made the altar of Amenemhat? How did they carve it? An exquisite ancient relic, which is, like much of ancient Egypt, highly compelling. There are many ancient monuments found all over the Earth which possess extraordinarily precise solar and lunar alignments. Ingenious designs, often many thousands of years old, constructed from stones, sometimes quarried, cut, and transported to the sites from many miles away. This movement of megaliths was accomplished using techniques or technology as yet not understood, and to date, many of these megalithic stone placements are perceived as near-impossible feats of ancient engineering. And although many impressive examples of monuments which track the sun can be found to have originated from many different civilizations, the most notable of antiquity, most famous for a seemingly obsessive level of monuments devoted to the observing of the sun's path, was undoubtedly the Neolithics. One has to wonder, why was there such a fixation? Was the motivation for this mass of undertakings of a tragic nature? Was it out of fear? Fear created by a memory of a catastrophic event, possibly involving the sun's powerful emittance of radiation? Maybe they experienced the consequences of an ancient warming cycle. We may never know. Yet the most important question in our field is not why these volumes of solar-aligned relics were created, but how. How did our ancient ancestors, claimed as having existed over 10,000 years ago, 
construct such precisely positioned granges, hinges, barrows, and sun daggers, something we have previously covered, an incredible type of sundial which tracked a sunspot across the wall of an ancient cave with each month, solstice and new year precisely marked out across the walls. Yet the sundials in question in this video are a group of far more familiarly designed dials left by the Neolithics. These sun-tracking dials can be found across the Neolithic sites of Ireland, Scotland, Orkney, and England. First discovered by an American by the name of Martin Brennan, a 39-year-old from New York. Not only did he discover the true function of curbstones located in Noth, codename K7, K15 among others, he also cracked the earliest form of writing while studying the Irish Stone Age artwork. Earlier this year, a theory emerged on the internet by writer and journalist Ben Gagna. He suggested that there was an image of a swan on curbstone 15 at Nonth. He claimed that while examining a photo he had taken of K15, he flipped it upside down and saw something no one had ever seen before – the faint but unmistakable image of a swan in profile. The true meaning or purpose of the curbstones had for a long time been heavily debated within certain circles. The intriguing cup and ring marks had been known of for some time. Yet as previously mentioned, though the most popular theory of the design on K15 was the claim that it was the depiction of a swan glyph, this hypothesis was rejected even before Martin's unarguably accurate translation was discovered. Martin identified the sundial while examining a passage mount in the Boyne Valley. And although sundials thousands of years old have been excavated throughout Europe, many specialist individuals reviewing Martin's finds believe that the sundial discovered in County Meath is the oldest and possibly most important ever found. According to Martin, who has been studying megalithic Irish art for the last 10 years, Ireland's megalithic tombs are suffering from appalling neglect. Some of the most important passage mounds excavated previously have been ignored or, conveniently, completely sealed up. Martin's discoveries are undoubtedly remarkable and are of tremendous value to our ongoing deciphering of ancient antiquity and its past civilizations. It is a journey of discovery we find highly compelling. There are many ancient monuments found all over the Earth which possess extraordinarily precise solar and lunar alignments. Ingenious designs, often many thousands of years old, constructed from stones sometimes quarried, cut, and transported to the sites from many miles away. This movement of megaliths was accomplished using techniques or technology as yet not understood, and to date, many of these megalithic stone placements are perceived as near-impossible feats of ancient engineering. And although many impressive examples of monuments which track the sun can be found to have originated from many different civilizations, the most notable of antiquity, most famous for a seemingly obsessive level of monuments devoted to the observing of the sun's path, was undoubtedly the Neolithics. One has to wonder, why was there such a fixation? Was the motivation for this mass of undertakings of a tragic nature? Was it out of fear? Fear created by a memory of a catastrophic event, possibly involving the sun's powerful emittance of radiation. Maybe they experienced the consequences of an ancient warming cycle. We may never know. Yet the most important question in our field is not why these volumes of solar-aligned relics were created, but how. How did our ancient ancestors, claimed as having existed over 10,000 years ago, construct such precisely positioned granges, hinges, barrows, and sun daggers? Something we have previously covered, an incredible type of sundial which tracked a sunspot across the wall of an ancient cave with each month, solstice and new year precisely marked out across the walls. Yet the sundials in question in this video are a group of far more familiarly designed dials left by the Neolithics. These sun-tracking dials can be found across the Neolithic sites of Ireland, Scotland, Orkney, and England. First discovered by an American by the name of Martin Brennan, a 39-year-old from New York. Not only did he discover the true function of curbstones located in Noth, 
codename K7, K15, among others. He also cracked the earliest form of writing while studying the Irish Stone Age artwork. Earlier this year, a theory emerged on the internet by writer and journalist Ben Gagna. He suggested that there was an image of a swan on curbstone 15 at Nonth. He claimed that while examining a photo he had taken of K15, he flipped it upside down and saw something no one had ever seen before – the faint but unmistakable image of a swan in profile. The true meaning or purpose of the curbstones had for a long time been heavily debated within certain circles. The intriguing cup and ring marks had been known of for some time. Yet as previously mentioned, though the most popular theory of the design on K15 was the claim that it was the depiction of a swan glyph, this hypothesis was rejected even before Martin's unarguably accurate translation was discovered. Martin identified the sundial while examining a passage mount in the Boyne Valley. And although sundials thousands of years old have been excavated throughout Europe, many specialist individuals reviewing Martin's finds believe that the sundial discovered in County Meath is the oldest and possibly most important ever found. According to Martin, who has been studying megalithic Irish art for the last 10 years, Ireland's megalithic tombs are suffering from appalling neglect. Some of the most important passage mounds excavated previously have been ignored or, conveniently, completely sealed up. Martin's discoveries are undoubtedly remarkable and are of tremendous value to our ongoing deciphering of ancient antiquity and its past civilizations. It is a journey of discovery we find highly compelling. In our last video, we explored compelling links connecting the countless Neolithic ruins which litter much of the world, long claimed as the work of separate Stone Age groups who, due to the claimed era of construction, supposedly never made contact. Flint-wielding ancestors, attributed with inexplicable trilithons many tons in weight, incredibly precise alignments, and an impressive, intimate knowledge of some of the most complex of solar orbits known to man. We posited that, regardless of the claimed isolation of these separate groups, the similarity found among many Neolithic buildings is unarguable evidence, suggesting that Neolithic man either didn't create these structures or they were not the primitive nomad they have long been claimed as, but were instead a world-going, world-dominating superpower who built the same enigmatic barrows and henges the world over, the Harhug. These mystifying Neolithic structures are conveniently rarely explored. This may be due to their existence being a difficult task to explain. Claimed as that of tombs, it is the sheer number of them, however, which makes their existence a baffling thing to explain. As mentioned previously, many of the building types dating from the Neolithic age turn up on more than one continent. Yet the Harhug and its once enormous collection of over 600 individual so-called tombs are unique in their shape and style. Currently claimed as having belonged to the ancient settlements of the Funnel Beaker culture, who lived around 3000 BC, and although, as mentioned, there were once approximately 600 of them, the Harhug have been getting actively destroyed since their rediscovery in the modern age, with over half of them now having been destroyed to date. The megalithic tombs are built with large, rough stone slabs, each arranged into different random patterns. Ernst Sprockhoff, who created the six-category classification for Neolithic dolmens, classified them as extended dolmens. The other five types are simple dolmen, great dolmen, passage grave, long barrow, and cyst. Discovered in 1925 during excavations of Earth for the construction of the Hindenburg Dam, they were regardless largely ignored and have been little investigated since, with a brief archaeological inspection having took place in 1936. The Nurhag, a stone structure with a similar enigmatic, yet unique and once an equally numerous ruin, is a Stone Age dwelling we have previously covered. Found on the island of Sardinia, they are the main type of ancient megalithic edifice found in Sardinia, yet rather differently to the lack of attention given to the mysterious Harhugs, the Nurhag have come to be the symbol of Sardinia, and indeed its distinctive culture and dwarfing the 60 Harhugs, more than 7,000 Nurhags have been found to date, though archaeologists believe that originally there were more than 10,000. And this could quite possibly be the case with the Harhugs as well, for in reality, 
no one can say for sure who built them, why they built them, or perhaps most importantly, when in human history this took place. Although little is known regarding the Harhugs, they are undoubtedly an incredible collection of Stone Age relics, ones which we find highly compelling. Over the past few weeks, the channel has been focusing on the many Neolithic ruins which can still be found littering our planet. Enigmatic earthworks, built in a bygone age, supposedly by our primitive, flint-wielding ancestors. Enormous ancient undertakings, like that of the Long Barrows or Solstice-aligned mounds such as Newgrange. We also explored dolmens, found the world over along with many other recurring Neolithic features. However, there still remains many as yet unexplained, yet clearly excellently executed ruins that, due to the capabilities of their past constructor, fortunately still exist to this day. Ancient supposed Neolithic ruins, such as that of the effigy mounds. It seems, regardless of the gigantic effort these would have once been, for currently claimed architects, these effigy mounds, such as that of the Great Serpent Mound of Ohio, the largest surviving mound of this type, were created merely for entertainment purposes, or perhaps as an offering to the gods. We are, in the modern age, fully aware of serpent worship, once undertaken by ancient civilizations across South America. And due to these already understood ancient belief systems, the possibility that these unexplained mounds may have been religiously motivated becomes a logical postulation. The Great Serpent Mound is 1,348 feet long and runs along the landscape continually 3 feet high. It is claimed by some as Neolithic, yet no one seems to be able to definitively determine its age. A prehistoric effigy, located upon a plateau, aptly named Serpent Mound Crater in Adams County, Ohio. Now maintained by the Ohio History Connection, it has been designated as a National Historic Landmark by the United States Department of Interior. The Serpent Mound of Ohio was first reported from surveys by Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis in their historic volume Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, published in 1848 by the newly founded Smithsonian Origin. We feel Due to its inexplicable nature, archaeologists will continue to find these incredible relics difficult to explain. As such, the origins of the mound are still heavily debated. The mound, like many other ruins we've covered, we posit were in fact left by a civilization far older than currently conceived, and as such, like the many similar sites and ruins we have explored, contains no archaeological artifacts no burials, and no dating material, leaving academics with no later inhabitants to pin the site's construction on. As such, they remain incapable of establishing a permitted claim as to the age of the mound. The two main funded theories are that it was either created by the Adena culture around 320 BC or the Fort Ancient around 1070 AD. However, these claims are both light in regards to any compelling lines of deference to argue said hypothesis. Archaeologists began attributing the mound to the Fort Ancient culture within the publication of Serpent Mound, a Fort Ancient Icon, in 1996. A 2017 article, Radiocarbon Dates Reveal Serpent Mound is More Than 2,000 Years Old, argues for a construction by the Adena culture circa 320 BC, yet any solid data to confirm said claims remain elusive. The academic debate regularly experiences rebuttals, with each published in the Mid-Continental Journal of Archaeology. Who built the Great Serpent Mound? 
or indeed the effigy mounds as a whole? Were they, as we claim, the work of a now lost, serpent-worshipping civilization? Just like that of South America's inexplicable ruins? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. Among the beautiful Greek islands, there is one in particular, Euboa, which hides a secret, one of the most enigmatic mysteries to be found anywhere within the Mediterranean. Built into the landscape of the island, 25 ancient yet masterfully built and geologically camouflaged structures, which are known as Dracospita, or the Dragon Houses, still found dotting the island's landscape. Often built using enormous multi-ton limestone blocks, thus making their explanation very difficult to explain, and also quite possibly multiple remnants of a now lost but once technologically and capably advanced civilization, one which far predated that of our own well-known, well-studied ancestors. The true age, origin, or indeed past function of these mysteriously, curiously named dragon houses remains a complete mystery. Now found in varying degrees of decay, Yet the substantial erosion present in some areas of some of the dragon houses is indicative of a civilization far predating any known or, more specifically, academically permitted groups as having once been responsible. Researchers working for ancient code have posited that many of the surviving dragon houses were built using, quote, cyclopean masonry. And after exploring the curious structures ourselves, we seem to concur with this opinion. Yet the mystery as to why these buildings were made in the first place, the motivation for their curious creation, still remains. According to said research, the locals dubbed the structures dragon houses. This because local legend telling of attributes in which their creators possessed they were supposedly bestowed with superhuman powers. This conclusion, however, is disagreed with, and rather ironically, using the exact same feature which proved these buildings are inexplicable, is now argued as having been inspired by later rediscoverers due to the size of the stone blocks used in the building process, something modern academia, due to a lack of an ability to explain said anomaly, would simply ignore this aspect during their own explorations of the site. It seems that although those funded to provide the answers, when found lacking, are more than happy to continue to provide a status quo, often in blatant denial of facts in front of us all. A tale of events which does not ruffle the feathers of those who fund said research. Thus, such practices can be looked upon as job security, displays of allegiance to those who pull the strings of said institution. Thus, although capable, funded individuals have a reoccurring habit of overlooking the same said features over and over again. However, those with other, often self-funded motivations, or indeed a set of sturdy foundational ethics, then those with a keen eye for facts can always expose that which is ignored by others with an agenda. These valiant pioneers, these modern-day Indiana Jones, have an opportunity to approach that which has not yet been explained with curiosity and a hunger for the truth, which could make them the person who alters the world around them, and ultimately makes a real difference to the world around you. Wikipedia states, dragons can not only mean a reptilian fire-breathing giant lizard, but also man, those who possess superhuman powers. Furthermore, according to Wikipedia, there is no accepted theory about the identity of the builders, nor an agreed estimation on their dating. No mention is identified in classical texts, and the first account so far known to have been cited dates from the 18th century, done by the British geologist-traveler-writer John Hawkins. The first detailed account, after Hawkins, was by German archaeologist H. N. Ulrichs, written in 1842. The French classical scholar Jules Girard visited Euboa and described the Ochi dragon houses in detail. In 2010, Swiss archaeologist Karl Rieber successfully tracked down all to-date reported buildings, subsequently published a report upon the completion of his research. Yet, alas, any explanation as to their original purpose, or indeed true age, was predictably lacking from the report. Thus, the site is currently crying. 
capable antiquarians are desperately needed to explore and unravel the mysterious dragon houses of Greece. Houses we find highly compelling.